morning everybody and welcome to church and today I'm here with Margarita. Hola! Hello everyone! Hello Vanessa! Hi, how are you doing today? It's the muy bien! You know why I'm so excited today? Why? It's Christmas oh, week! Yay. Yeah. Feliz Navidad! Oh, Feliz Navidad! Feliz Navidad! I, I'm so happy! And I already, I got all my dresses and I remembered what you told me. Mm. Do you remember? Well, just remind the boys and girls what I told you. Boys and girls, Denise had told me that Christmas is all about celebrating Jesus. That he came as a baby to live with us and so he would die on the cross to pay for our sins. Mm, that is correct. So we can celebrate so much. Is that why we celebrate Christmas? Yes, that is why we celebrate because we remember that Jesus, he was born on the earth so that he could later die on the cross for our sins. Oh, that is amazing. And I want to ask you, what you what you going to do this week? What do you do the week of Christmas? Do you go to the beach? Do you... You don't study this week, eh? No, no. no. <laughs> it's holiday time. It's holiday, yeah. What's your favorite thing to do in the holidays? Well, spend time with my family and, yeah, spend time with my family and my friends as well. Yeah. And Vanessa, you know, I know in my village, lots of people, they go away and then they see some people who don't have much of family mm. or amigos and then can, can they come to church and be part of our family for Christmas? Yes, definitely. You can invite all your friends that you want to come to church, even those that don't know Jesus, because then they can have a chance to learn about him as well. Yeah, that's a big, big, big good idea. Yeah. And Vanessa, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, definitely. Come closer, I whisper. Did you buy me a present for Christmas? Mm, not yet. <laughs> oh, okay. If you do, my chicken needs shoes. Okay. 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 So thank you. I'll see uh, what I can do for you. Okay. So we're going to go and go get some food for Christmas lunch because we like to eat and celebrate. Yeah. Mm, yes. Yes. So we go shopping, but after church, first we we stay for church and then we go shopping. Okay. okay? Yes. Yes. It's all a right. Plan. That's a plan. And we see you Christmas, and we hope you all have a beautiful Christmas and you come join us here by church as we worship Jesus together. Okay boys and girls, mummies and puppies, we see you on Christmas. Bye bye! Bye! Hi, what Christmas means to me is um, I think it's twofold. I think the first thing that it means is, is a time for celebration, a time to celebrate what uh, God the Father has done in sending Jesus Christ um, for us. That's the greatest gift that we could ever receive um, and it's a time to celebrate that and I think it's also a time to invite others to celebrate that with us. You know, friends, family, people who don't maybe know um, what the true reason for, for, for celebrating is um, and I think it's those two things that Christmas uh, means to me. Of course, uh, being a Christian and all that, uh, Christmas is about celebrating the birth of Jesus or Christianity. But for me personally, I feel it's a time where we connect with family members that we aren't in contact with too often or like friends. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a day where people should be together, not be alone sobbing in their room on Christmas Day or jealous of your neighbours or anything. So yeah, it's a time where you should be together with someone else or a group of people. For me, Christmas is a time where we can celebrate Christ's birth, His ministry on earth and Him just being such an awesome saviour that He is and taking our place for us and yeah, overcoming death in the world and also just celebrating God for all that He's done in our lives and just a time of being thankful and praising God for all that He's done for us. Christmas to me serves as a powerful reminder of God's love towards me. Indeed, the same God who made the heavens, the earth and the universe, who created me, is the same God who unilaterally decided to forsake his throne so that he could die for my sins and so that I could have everlasting life and be reconciled with God. 
This is love unmatched. This is love that I celebrate every day of my life. This is what Christmas reminds me of. Amen. Well, good morning, church, and what an awesome way to start this morning's service. Hearing from you guys what Christmas is all about, Margarita, Vanessa, it's exciting week ahead, the week of Christmas. And I hope that you are looking forward to what God has got in store. You know, the word hope is everywhere over Christmas time. And particularly this Christmas, I want to remind you that you have every reason to hope. Not because of what's going on in our world, but because of what is going on in this word from the Lord Jesus. I want to start our time off today in worship by reading a psalm to you that can encourage you in this season as we prepare not to look down just at a manger, but to lift up our eyes in hope and expectation. And I'm reading to you from Psalm 121. And the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming forth from this time forth and even forevermore. That is a word for every one of you joining today's service. And so as we look and consider the manger, Christ coming down, we can still lift up our eyes knowing that our help has come. Our hope is here and that is from the Lord Jesus Christ. So why don't you stand up with me and for everything within you, let's worship the Lord because the King has come. There's reason to celebrate. There's reason to hope. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word. As the world turns and thinks of Christmas just as looking down at a baby in a manger, we lift our eyes up this morning. We lift our eyes up not only to Christ on the cross, but we lift our eyes up to Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father, reigning in victory, reigning with authority, reigning with power, and therefore we can have hope in this season. God, you are in control. There is nothing that's going on that is out of your control. And we rejoice and celebrate your coming because you've given us reason to hope. Blessed be your name. Amen. Come on church, let's worship the Lord together.
Father, thank you so much that you are our joy, Lord, that you not only came 2,000 years ago to bring joy, but you are right here on this day in 2020, bringing joy to hearts. And I pray, Lord God, that right now for those who are listening and worshiping, that you would stir up within them that sense that you are working, God that you are fully in control of the seas and Lord, just move our hearts now as we continue in worship to praise and to give you the adoration that you deserve, the glory that belongs to your name. Church, as we continue in a time of worship, I want to share some words with you um, and we're going to go on to another worship song after this. As you know, last Sunday at our, our live church gathering and at New Life in Christ City Church, we asked our members to, to pick up on some pens and papers and to pray and ask God for some prophetic scriptures, words that we could share with you that they felt the Lord is saying, not only to them, but to you as well. Those of you watching, whether you're a part of one of our home churches or the various other churches around our city or wherever you are. And I wanted to read some of these. So just take a moment, close your eyes, listen to these scriptures, listen to these prayers, and may the Spirit of God minister and encourage your heart as we continue to worship Him in this way. Oh, Isaiah 40 verse 31, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Yes, Lord, we pray that you would bring that to pass in the lives of those listening. A word someone wrote, just four words down. Lord, transplant, transform, transition and change. Oh God, won't you do that in our country? Won't you do that in our lives, in our families? Perhaps those words are speaking to you about something in your life that needs to do that. A word coming in from there saying, hold fast, the King will bring it to pass. Jesus is rebuilding his church. It might look like things are crumbling, guys, but Jesus is building. Jesus is building his church and amen to that. And the scripture given by one of our young people from Mark eleven twenty two, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. 
That is a word for one of you this morning. Have faith in God. Your faith has perhaps been shaken. Have faith in God. Do not be moved in this season. Again, another word, it's time to build church. It's time to build. This is not a time to retreat, but a time to move forward. My son, if your heart becomes wise, I will rejoice. Rejoice. We celebrate and think of wise men who came to see the infant child. The scripture is telling us that the, your heart needs to become wise in this season and rejoicing will follow. Jesus says over here in John 11, a word that says triumph. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? How many of you want to see the glory of God this morning? Believe in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Be faithful at all times, it says there. It says in your word, fear not. I am the Lord. 2021 is a blessing. Fear no evil. And so the Lord continues, feels like we, God is saying we need to go out and win souls. This is not a season for hibernation, it's a season for worship. So let's, as we continue in this next worship song, and just make this next song your prayer and asking God to fulfill these words in your life, your family, your community, your church. Let's worship together.
Yes, Lord Jesus, come and pour out your Holy Spirit upon us right now, we pray. That is our prayer, Lord. Pour out your Spirit, Lord God. We want more of you in our lives, Lord Jesus. We, we know that you've promised that if anyone thirsts, let him come to you and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow those torrents of living water. And Jesus, we're thirsty today. We need your spirit. We need your presence. We need your power, Lord. Come and give us that life-giving spirit that transforms our lives, Lord. That gives us that life-changing experience right now today, Lord God. And I want to pray for every person who's listening, every person that's gathering together, Lord, every person who's watching, that right now that they would know the presence of your spirit in them, Lord, in their room, that there would just be such an overwhelming sense of you your power and your majesty come and work in this place today we pray in Jesus name amen amen church what an amazing service and what an amazing time of worship we've been experiencing that's been so awesome to hear those verses and those words that the Lord has been giving you and we're so trusting that going ahead that the Lord's going to speak so much more to his church through his church and we just need to be obedient to heed those words and to follow him wherever he leads us and with that same heart of worship and filled with the Holy Spirit, let's prepare ourselves to give to the Lord today. This is the last Sunday before Christmas. You know, there's not many benefits to being saved later on in life. But one of the benefits that I found is I could experience the, this change in my life as to my attitude and my heart towards Christmas. You know, for many years before I was saved, I really didn't care about Christmas apart from the, the food, the drink, and being able to get gifts. I didn't really like giving them so much, I liked getting them. And it was after I was saved, after the Spirit of Jesus Christ came into me, after I was born again, that suddenly my whole focus shifted. Suddenly this time wasn't a time all about me, but this was about Jesus and about the people that He's placed around me that He wants to love through me. You know, where I used to love getting gifts, one of the first things that changed is now I love giving gifts. You know, my wife Caroline, I think she's so frustrated with me. She'll ask me, hey, is there anything that you want for Christmas? I go, you know, no, not really, but what do you want? Like, you know, I just want to see her face light up when I'm able to bless her with something. And I think this is the heart of Jesus, where ultimately he is the one that gave the biggest gift that any one of us could ever see. He gave his own life for us. You know, there's this beautiful parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13. And it's about um, a merchant who was looking for beautiful pearls. And it says that when this merchant had found this one pearl of great price, that he gave all that he had. He sold all that he had and he went and he bought it. And this is a parable, a picture of what Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us. When he saw the importance and that value, that precious price of your soul, of your salvation, of that relationship with you, he gave all that he had. He left heaven. He left those streets of gold. He came to earth. He was fully man, yet fully God. He lived a life on this earth for 33 years. And he gave that life on the cross for your sins, that you could have this eternal life with him. And you know that says that if we're Christ's, the Spirit of Christ dwells within us. And that Spirit of Christ is that same Spirit that knows that it's so much better to give than it is to receive. And with that, let's let the Lord move through us and give us that Spirit of generosity today as we give to the Lord. As Jesus gave all for us, we can give all for Him, not to gain salvation, but as a result of everything that He's done. So in a few moments, you're going to have this opportunity to bless the Lord, to worship the Lord, to give your finances to the Lord. And do that with a cheerful heart, with a generous spirit, and in all rejoicing and joy, because you have been bought by God himself, who gave everything for you. In a moment, there'll be a snap scan code on the screen, banking details, as well as ways that you can give using your cards. And I want to pray for us in this time that the Lord would just so give us a joy in this season where we can give to him. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you so much for that amazing, amazing, amazing gift that you gave us. Your very life so that we could have eternal life. And God, if you've so freely given of yourself to us, 
how much more can we freely give to you? Oh Lord, you are amazing. And we thank you so much for all that you've done. And Lord, won't you just stir up in our hearts a heart of generosity towards you, Lord God, that we would be able to give with liberality, give with cheerfulness and give with love to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Jesus, come and have your way in our lives. Come and receive these free will offerings to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you do when life doesn't go according to plan? I think as we have gone through this crazy year, I think there are a lot of us who could say, my life hasn't gone according to plan. You know, we've got a great example and illustration of that right here in the Christmas story, the account of the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Christmas season, I want to bring this message to you to be able to inspire you, to encourage you, to help you to realize that when life doesn't go according to plan, that yes, in Jesus Christ, there are certain things that we can know and certain things that we can do. Now, can you imagine what it would be like if you were going on vacation somewhere and the place where you were expecting to stay, as you came there, you're there with your luggage, your bags, and you're outside the doors of this hotel or motel or whatever it may be, bed and breakfast. And as you're about to open the door, there's this big sign that says, no room. You'd be turning around at the honey and going, what do we do now? But look at the scripture in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. It speaks of Mary and it says, She brought forth her firstborn son. She wrapped him in bands of cloth and placed him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. I want you to read with me. And this morning we are going to get some encouragement out of God's word about how to find comfort in Christ when your life doesn't go according to plan. Let's read from the scriptures. It's Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to be reading a couple of verses right over here. It says in verse 1, At that time the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for a baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. 
I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what that angel had said to them about this child. What do you do when life takes these kind of unexpected turns? The verse I want to draw your attention to is in verse 7, where it says, and it mentions, Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and placed him in a feeding trough, the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, right here, if you just think what is going on in the life of Mary and Joseph, firstly, you've got an unplanned pregnancy. Um, Mary was probably, as most people believe, about 14 years of age. It was completely unexpected, especially in the mind of Joseph, that she would fall pregnant at this stage of her life. You've got an unplanned pregnancy. Secondly, you've got an unwelcome reception. It says in the Gospel of John that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. How true this was right here in the little town of Bethlehem as they found no room for him. Now remember, back in these days, there was no Airbnb, there was no bookings.com, there was no lacoslap.co.za. Um, they had to go and hope for the best. But of course, in their minds, they were expecting they'd be accommodated in an inn. And so you've got an unplanned pregnancy, an unwelcome reception. Thirdly, you've got an unpleasant birth. For Mary, just think about this, that she was giving birth outdoors. I don't know any woman that would opt for an outdoors kind of birth, would you? Um, no. And so she had to have this whole experience of going into labor, giving birth. Just think about all of this outdoors where the animals were. So you've got an unplanned pregnancy. You've got an unwelcome reception. You've got an unpleasant birth. And fourthly, you've got an unusual celebration. Suddenly, these shepherds barge in. Mary and Joseph don't know them from a bar of soap and they're all gathering around and looking at the baby and they're probably going, what on earth is going on here? No family members, but these strangers. And so just think what they were going for. And now let me set the scene a little bit for you here. This manger, it's mentioned a few times here in the scripture. Now this manger um, it says in here yeah, in the New Living Translation, a feeding trough, which is exactly what it was. This was that either made out of wood or hollowed out of stone. But this was the place where the food for the livestock, the cattle, sheep, horses, whatever it else might be, were fed. And that would have been the very place where Jesus lay down. Now, you know, today in South Africa, it's common what I've seen a lot of farmers do is they'll take old tractor ties, they'll cut them in half and they'll lay them down and they'll use that for their feeding troughs, for their, their lambs and for their sheep. And this was the place where Jesus was born in the feeding trough, wrapped up in there. Now notice, I know we've all got those old mental pictures of, you know, this quaint little stable scene, the barn, the nice soft hay, Mary and Joseph looking at each other dreamily. No, there's no mention of them having anything over their heads. They were likely completely outdoors in a sheepfold. And these sheepfolds were made out of stone, dusty, dirty, 
And that's where Mary, in this very unhygienic environment, was holding her little child, the Lord Jesus. Just think about that. Now, it's obvious, and I think for those of you, if you just read this carefully, that they weren't tucked away inside a closed stable because the Lord told when he's talking to the shepherds and he said to them, go look. And they walked down through the streets of Bethlehem and they spotted because it was obviously open air place, the sheepfold. And there they saw the mother and father and of course the baby. The, remember the sign, you will see with your eyes, you will see that baby lying in the feeding trough. And that's what they saw. You know, I really think when I think about this and I think about our children, our four kids that, um, you know, with every one of them, when Corin was pregnant and expecting how much detail, how much attention she would put into that room. Once she would come back from the hospital and bring the little child, the little infant back and place him in the little crib. And of course, curtains and pictures and everything just arranged absolutely beautifully. Mary didn't have that. Just think about it. This angel, this manger here is mentioned three times. In fact, even the angels say this will be a sign. You will notice that the baby lying in the animal trough. And so what a vivid sight this was. Now, a couple of just special things here. When I think of Jesus lying in this feeding trough, the first is I realized that Jesus, well, right there, his birthplace, if you'd say place of birth, what was it? The sheepfold. And just think about John chapter 10, where Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd. And he says, I lay down my life for the sheep and I want to, there's other sheep that I want to bring into the flock. And there can be one flock and one shepherd. And just realize as you're watching this, if you want to be part of Jesus' flock, you have to be born into it. You have to come by the birth. Remember, Jesus spoke of the second birth, being born into his family. And so, born in a sheepfold, and then just think of this trough. This is where the grain would be poured in, and then, of course, the animals would eat off it. Jesus being the bread of life, the one that we feed and that we eat off. And then, of course, think of this trough. This is not something that would be up at this level, eye level. It would be right down at foot level where the sheep could kind of put their necks down and begin to eat off. And so just think Jesus coming right down to our low level. You know, he left heaven and came down to earth. Um, he lowered himself. Jesus became us. He became man. And so for our sake and at a low level, and then of course, just think of the dirt. You know, wherever the feeding troughs are, I've always noticed there's a lot of dirt around there because the animals, as they come in, and normally you've got one trough and you've got probably a 10, 12 sheep that are gathering around it at one time and they're all pushing, bumping. And of course, there's, you know, kicking up ground with their hooves and there's never any good grass growing around a feeding trough because they've all trotted out so well. And so this is the place where Jesus is lying there in that trough, in this unhygienic area. And that makes me think of Jesus bearing our dirt, bearing our sins. But when you think of all this, how do you find your comfort in Christ? When things don't go according to plan, Mary certainly did not plan this kind of birth. She had something much higher in mind. I can imagine her as she was going and they were going on that long journey from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And she was probably, if I can guess, in her mind, she was imagining and maybe even saying to Joseph, OK, well, you know, I know there's that inn in Bethlehem and we'll probably get a nice ground floor room. And um, I can maybe decorate it a little bit, just make it really nice and cozy. And she must have had that thought going on in her mind. And of course, when they get there and there's the bad news. Hey, there's no room for you guys. Sorry. And they've got no other course but to go outside to the sheepfold and take that trough and this place in the dirt. Wow. 
Just think about that. Sometimes we don't ponder these things too much. When life doesn't go according to plan. You know, I want to tell you a true story from my life and Karen. Is, you know, when we had gotten married and we had this desire to go to uh, Bible college. And um, we had looked around different Bible colleges around the world. And the one that we had settled on in California. Wow, it was beautiful. Set there in a really nice setting on a resort with great fountains and lakes and just looked absolutely beautiful. I mean, the pictures could have sold you. And uh, we signed up and, you know, we, we got accepted into this program. And um, as we traveled, of course, we had these ideas. We had these thoughts. Oh, I can imagine this nice big apartment because I read they said, oh, they've got married couples accommodation. And I imagine in my mind this nice, you know, two, three bedroom apartment overlooking the lake and, um, you know, beautiful ducks. And I, I had I had these thoughts going through my mind, imagined the nice meals that we were going to be enjoying then the rest time. And and, um, I, you know, we had these thoughts, these expectations in our minds. Well, we were horribly brought to reality. We flew in halfway across the world. Uh, we had to fly into some small airport in California. I'd never been there before. Didn't know the airport, small airport we landed on this. And of course, we had notified them all. We'd said, OK, we're arriving. Here's our arrival. Here's our flights. And um, we were finally got in the small airport and we're looking around, looking around. And of course, we were expecting there'd be someone holding our names up and ah, nothing. We walked around and of course we didn't know what to do. We didn't know the airport, didn't know the area. And uh, so Karen and I said, I wonder if they forgot about us. I wonder what. And uh, of course we waited and waited and waited like half a day. And uh, eventually someone came pulling in. All right. Well, that was a really reality check. And then finally we get to our nice luxury of condo apartment we were expecting only to discover we just got the small little box of a room. And then, of course, we were expecting comfort and we get there. And of course, the least thing we expected was a double bed. We got there, there's two single beds and they said, sorry, that's all we got. I mean, we are newly wed and I'm going, oh, my word. And of course, everything one thing after another was a letdown and uh, we were just, you know, uh, with, with everything. I was thinking expectation, reality, expectation, reality. Well, I expected punctuality. I got lateness. I expected um, largeness. I got smallness. I expected comfort. I got discomfort. I expected a rest time. I got hard labor. I expected I'd be able to sleep at a decent time on weekends. I discovered that I had to work through the weekends and uh, we had to do this. There was this program that was um, in basically this whole resort. The students were those who ran it. So we had to do meals and catering for guests that would come onto this resort. And uh, we realized we were the, the cheap labor to keep this camp going. And um, so there was working through our weekends when I thought I'd be surfing. And you know, I, I nicknamed that place. I called it Uncle Laban's Labor Camp because that's really what it was like. And um, I mean, what a horrible reality check it was. But you know, guys, I can tell you that with everything that I went through, it was the most blessed time in our early marriage. When I just think about what we, how we grew and it was really uh, you know, if I think about it, it was discipleship through discomfort. <laughs> That's I want to propose that to you. Discipleship through discomfort. And it's often, and what I have found is that God takes us through these times. He's got things he wants to do in us. And I know in my heart, there were a lot of areas that needed to be chipped off, a lot of pride, you know, a lot of things that I thought like, you know, I was going to have it different. People were going to give me special moments and opportunity. None of that came. Um, and so just going through all those experiences, we realize so often our expectations can lie to us. And guys, we're often not prepared for this. 
You know, people go into ministry having expectations. They take new jobs having expectations. They get married having expectations. And they have children having expectations. Uh, uh, you know, when you start the, a new year, January 1st, 2020, we had expectations of this new year, new decade. No one expected COVID. And so often our mental, our thoughts, our perceptions can lie to us. And they can kind of try to paint a cozy picture, something that is not reality. And then reality slaps us in the face. And, uh, you know, when I listen to the words and I like what Paul says in the book of Philippians, chapter four and verse 11, listen to what he says. He says, I've learned something in life. I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty with plenty or with little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now listen, twice here Paul says, I have learned. I've learned something here. Now what Paul is implying here is, it's, it, is Paul was discipled through discomfort. Guys, I want, to, I want those words to stick into your head. Discipleship through discomfort. This is what Paul experienced. It's what Timothy experience is what the apostles experienced and many others but Paul said I have learned through these discomforts in whatever state I am to be content you know contentment is a beautiful state of your heart it's really a, a sober way of looking at life and saying I'm not going into this new year with this expectation or that expectation I'm not going into this with expectation just whatever I find myself in I'll make the most of it. Is that true of you? Is it? I hope so. Now, many years ago, we were ministering to a man and he had, a young man, but being on the street, had come down from Pretoria, come to Cape Town and, and uh, he, you know, got in, of course, mixed up in a bad crowd of people and uh, his life was just going fast down and um, we had shared the gospel with him. He got saved, baptized him. And um, he had a girlfriend up in Pretoria. was very concerned about him. And she was a believer. And of course, she was so excited when she heard he'd come to Christ. And um, so he was keen for her to come to Cape Town and that the two of them could live together and be married. And so um, we had asked him and we said, well, you know, do you have a place for her to stay? And he, at that time he was staying in a, a night shelter. And we were thinking, wow, okay, you're going to have to find a place to stay. You can't get married and move into a night shelter. And, and um, he was so eager to get married and she was so eager. And I can remember Karen talking to her and Karen giving her the reality check and, and saying, you know, what if, what if your future husband, what if he can't provide you with a nice apartment in Cape Town? What if you have to stay in some place where it's not exactly ideal? Um, and her answer, I will never forget, this beautiful young Christian lady. She said, well, if I don't like it, I will learn to love it. What beautiful words. If I don't like it, I will learn to love it. You know, that, that's always stuck with me over the years. Because often I find myself in situations that I don't like and neither do I love. And Paul is saying, I have learned to love it. I've learned when I've got an empty stomach to be content. I've learned when things are not going my way. Now, Paul, listen, he is writing from prison. I've learned to be content. And I believe that Mary and Joseph had both learned to be content. Whether they were inside the inn or outside the inn, they had learned the secret of contentment. Contentment with the Lord. And that is something that is so beautiful. Now, it's all about discipleship in discomfort. And the Lord has given us so many examples. I just think of what people have had to learn, like the Apostle Paul and like this young lady who was getting married. Learning to like it. If I think of Abram and Sarah, they had to learn 
to live in tents when God called them out of their homes. I think of Jacob who had to learn to live with the wife he didn't want to marry. And I think of Joseph who had to learn to live as a slave. And I think of Israel who had to learn to live in the wilderness. I think of David who had to learn to live the life of a fugitive. And I think of the disciples who had to learn to live with persecution. And Paul is saying, I have learned in all these things to be content. I think this is what the Lord desires. And again, there might be some of you who say, well, I didn't expect to get COVID. I didn't expect to find myself unemployed. I didn't expect that this year of schooling would be so difficult. In all these things we didn't expect, but can we learn to love these situations? I believe that as we are going into a new year, here's something, here's a word from the Lord for us. Discipleship through discomfort. It's the way that the Lord was molding Mary and Joseph as the parents of the Lord Jesus. He was showing them, listen, it's not the easiness of life, it's the blessedness of life that really makes the difference. Guys, we've got to wake up and stop just having these pie in the sky kind of imaginations that like, just really let us down time and time again. We need to learn to be content. I want to give you three points as I close and I think this is really to help you along in this journey. Like Mary and Joseph, there they were laying their firstborn son in a feeding trough. How could they do it? How can we go into similar times in our life without getting all knotted up, stressed out, just saying, God, I'm not going to trust you anymore. You let me down. No, we don't want to do all that. Here's three things. The first thing that I want to say to you is when life doesn't go according to plan, resist the impulse to complain, to have fear, to doubt. Remember Jesus saying, were you of little faith? Why did you doubt? Like just realize this, that the, one of the names of our Lord is the name Emmanuel. He is with us. So the Lord hasn't dumped you. He hasn't left you. What you are going through, what we are going through. Listen, this is not a sign of God's disfavor, just as it wasn't for Mary and Joseph. It was God's plan. And so first resist the urge when life doesn't go plan resist the urge to complain to be dissatisfied remember what you've learned you've learned discipleship through discomfort number two and this is so important when life doesn't go according to plan refocus refocus have a little reset in your mind a little refocus not onto the things you don't have but onto the things you do have so just think about this Mary did not have that beautiful room in the inn, the ensuite bathroom. She didn't have all that. What she did have was God's son in her very arms. She focused on what she did have. And then think of Joseph. Joseph, maybe he was even thinking, well, I've got relatives here. I've got family. Well, none of them could put them up for the night. But Joseph not focusing on what he didn't have, but what he did have. Well, he had a whole bunch of new friends, all these shepherds gathering around him, telling him this marvelous story of the angels that were appearing to them. What a glory moment for Joseph. So refocus, not on what you don't have, but on what you do have. Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, number three, from not only resisting, refocusing, Number three, rejoicing. When life doesn't go according to plan, start rejoicing. Listen, there is power in praise, power in worship. And the one thing I find, you know, when you begin to praise, when you begin to rejoice, it can make any dark situation in your life seem full of light. Mary, there's a beautiful passage here in Luke where Mary just worships and she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, she'd just been told she's going to get pregnant. She's going to have a child. But she worships. She praises. Guys, there's, there's power in praising the Lord. 
And so I want to leave you with these three thoughts. And when you think of this whole thing of discipleship through discomfort, this Christmas, ask God to give you the gift of being content, of being able to resist those negative thoughts, those complaints, feelings like God has left you. No, he hasn't. And to be able to refocus yourself to what you have right in front of you. And then thirdly, to be able to rejoice and to bless and to praise the Lord. Guys, I hope that as we go in this Christmas, we singing those Christmas songs that we are going to be lifting up the name of Jesus. Listen, this is a crazy time in the world. But the one thing that we can be sure of is that what the Lord was doing in the life of Mary and Joseph, He is doing in us and His children. And we can praise, we can rejoice, we can have joy in Him. Discipleship through discomfort. Paul saying, I've learned in whatever situation to be content. That's my prayer for you. This Christmas and going into this new year, let's just experience the supernatural power of the Spirit of God. Bring us to such a place where we can be like Paul, be like Mary, be like Joseph and praise God. Hey guys, if we're in the dirt, if we're in the dust, if we're in the COVID season, whatever it is, let's have peace. Can I pray for you? Father, in Jesus name, I want to pray for every believer watching this today and even perhaps someone who is not a believer. Lord, that they would lift up their eyes to you, that they would see the glory of the moment and what it is that you are currently doing in our world. And we want to thank you, Lord, that when those angels started singing, they were saying glory to the Lord on high and peace among men. And Lord, you are that same God who brings us peace. And I pray, Lord, for an unsettled heart this morning, that one that has an unsettled heart, settle it, bring that joy, bring that peace in the moment and that it would remain with them. And Lord, let us see your glory over this Christmas season. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
way to end today's service. Thank you for joining us to worship the King of Kings, to remember the child who came to, to be the man, to be the one who died on the cross for our sins, for your sins and for mine. We have reason to hope. You have reason to hope. You know what, if you're watching today and you want to know more about this hope, more about Jesus, why don't you get in contact with us? Down below there's information how you can visit us on our websites, Facebook, any social media platform. We want to hear from you. We want to reach out to you. Also go and have a look at our website, any of our other history videos and, and join us as well on Christmas Day as we're planning Christmas Day service, Christmas Eve service. If you want to know more about that, all the details are on our website. So again, thank you for joining us today. May the Lord bless you. May this week ahead be filled with hope and expectation. For the King has come and the King is coming. May the Lord bless you today.